Would you turn with me in your Bibles? We are going to finish the book of Judges today. So Judges, if you've ever been a student of of the book of Judges, as you know, ends with three heartbreaking, heartrending chapters. And rather than space it out over, oh, I don't know, four or five tear-filled, depressing Sunday mornings, I felt it best to read them together as a church family tonight. And so I'd like to just, we'll read them and I'll, I'll provide some basic commentary so we can understand the terms that are being used and understand the context. But I think that the the sorrow of the, how Israel's history unfolds will speak for itself. So let's turn to the, the last chapters of, of Judges. So I'm going to read from the New King James as usual. If you don't have a Bible today, I, we have some copies in the, our administrative space if anyone needs one. Well, let's dive on in. Judges 19. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Judges opens here by saying there was no king in Israel. Of course there was. There's Jesus. But they didn't want Jesus as their king. They didn't want God to be their king. God was rejected. And so they were doing things on their own. And this is the next three chapters are the result of what happens when we, not not necessarily a country, but any people, any person, lives without a, a compass, without a standard for righteousness, without a hope for a savior. You know, I met uh, Pastor Buzz this week. I was at a a Calvary Chapel pastor's conference, just got back. And Pastor Buzz is a Calvary Chapel pastor at Smith Mountain Lake. Nice old man. And uh, he's been pastoring for decades. And I learned a lot from him. He He told me that before he surrendered his life to the Lord in his 20s, that he learned everything about the Bible from his public school teacher. (laughs) I said, how does that work? Well, he was in the public school system until the 60s, or the mid-60s here in Virginia. And his teachers would start each day by reading one chapter of the Bible. And um, after they read one chapter of the Bible, the teacher would lead the class in prayer. And then the teacher would lead the class in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thus would begin every day of school for his uh, entire school education. Now, um, (laughs) that's like three times through the whole scriptures. What what an amazing education uh, just from listening to your teacher in the morning. Of course, it's not like that now. Uh, Not just in public schools, but in the world today, in America today, people are absolutely ignorant, not just of like Bible characters, but something so much more important. What the Bible teaches, that we're sinners and that Jesus came to save sinners. And we live in a time where people don't know their right hand from their left. People don't know up from down. They don't know about Boys being made boys and girls being made girls. The other uh, last spring, I had a chance to go on a vacation with my family to my mom and my mother and father in law's um, timeshare. We used our miles um, saved up during COVID and sent all the family to St. Thomas, which is a Caribbean island, beautiful place. Stayed in their timeshare and we went playing tennis. One of these, there was just a nice family playing tennis. And I don't know, I just like kids. And so I started playing tennis with some of these locals. And we were just having fun. It was some, a, couple boy, a couple little boys and their sister and their grandma, it turns out. And uh, the grandma was tired. She's just watching the kids. Um, she's like become the, the parent to these kids, her grandchildren. And so the kids are just there 
finding some shade. And we're, I gave them some balls to play with. And we started playing around. After about an hour or two, one of the boys uh, walked up to me. And we just started talking. I mean, we, were, we had been playing for hours. But he wanted to sit down and sit in the shade and talk. And one of the times, after a little bit, he asked me, are, do some boys, are some boys made half boy, half girl? And I informed him, no, everyone's just either a boy or a girl. And he said, oh. <laughs> and I was so heartbroken when this little boy has to ask some stranger from the middle of nowhere, um, what's up and what's down and what's right and what's left and where is anyone going to learn what's right and what's not? Unless they look to Scripture. And so it, this is what we find in these last three chapters of Judges are a people who just about three generations previously were walking with the Lord. Joshua was with them. Remember, God stopped the sun in the sky. God brought them into the promised land, defeated the giants. Miracles were done. The ark was with the Ten Commandments and Scripture was given. And now, just three, perhaps four generations later, they're dying spiritually and physically. And it reminds me, as we're reading these chapters, we ought not think, oh, this is Israel so bad. But we really ought to see our own vulnerability that though there was a great revival here in Virginia just perhaps two or three generations ago in our little town where there's maybe 50 churches now they're almost all empty we can turn uh, from God like maybe we could say we have turned from God like the people of Israel did who just in three generations lost their compass. So let us see what happens to a people without a right or a wrong. It says in verse 1 that there was a Levite who had a concubine, verse 1. Now a Levite, of course, was the ministers. They were one of the tribes of Israel set aside to be ministers. They taught the scriptures. They served in the tabernacle. They patched the curtains. They polished the um, the items that, for the, sacri- the altar and the things that needed to be repaired and fixed and worked on the nuts and bolts of the tabernacle. These were ministers set apart. So they received finances as people gave tithes and offerings to God. Um, the priests would divvy that up amongst the ministers, the, the Levites. Um, and so everyone would have money to feed their kids and people could serve the Lord. It was a good system, except it stopped being right. One of the problems was there was so much corruption. And as we saw on Sunday, the Levites were growing corrupt. And by the way, this Sunday we will continue in chapter 18 and find the corruption of the Levitical order. We'll continue that in four days on Sunday. But today we see how the Levites, the ministers, you could say the pastors, were immoral. And this immorality will spread and corrupt the people. So he has a concubine, which the Bible says, according to Matt, Jesus said in Matthew, a man should have one wife and a wife should have one husband. And because that's the way it was in the beginning, Genesis 1 through 3, God made them male and female in his image. He made them, Jesus said. And the two shall become one, not the three shall become one. Uh, not the two shall become one for a little while. But no, till death do they part. Jesus established this idea that two people shall become one. A male shall be one with a female. And so Jesus in the New Testament, obviously Genesis in the Old Testament, and from the beginning to the end of Scripture, we saw we find that God has a model for marriage. But people sometimes follow their libido more than the Lord. And these Levit- Levites, the, these ministers... Um, flesh and blood, and they too can follow their lusts rather than their Lord. And so this man fall, catches uh, a concubine, that is a second wife, or a servant, or uh, depending on your translation, um, she might just be called a young wife, 
But she was not the first wife. She was a second wife. And if your translation uses the word servant girl here, that's because they often were double duty. They were a servant, oh, and kind of a substitute wife when their master slash husband demanded it. It's a terrible system. And every time the Bible uh, makes note of a person with a concubine, it always, without exception, records the great problems that come from this broken marital system. And so here, unfortunately, it's the ministers. Now, so verse 2. But his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and was there four whole months. Then her husband arose and went after her and bring her back, having his servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. So we get the impression that this young concubine, this second wife, was very young, perhaps a a child still. And now she escapes her husband and goes back home to her dad and presumably other family members, sisters, and um, perhaps a mother as well. She wants to go back home. And this Levite, a minister, goes and finds her. And so based on verse 3, it says the father of this little girl Um, is glad to meet the girl's husband for the first time. It says to meet him. So in other words, there was, if there was a wedding, the parents weren't even allowed there. So this is a very uneven, unbalanced marriage. I'm not sure we would even call it a marriage. This is a relationship that see serving the man and the woman is suffering. She will suffer so much more. But this is often the way it is with immorality. It's often the vulnerable who suffer the most, the the women and the children. The Bible never um, shies away from this, that strength is given to protect the weak. Are you of able mind and body? You are given that able mind and body to establish safety, to, to help others, to serve others. And when those who have strength, like a minister who has spiritual strength, Lord willing, or or financial strength, as we shall see he has, and and even societal standing. He has been given strength. He should be using it for protecting and establishing, helping, serving the Lord. He's using it to help himself. This little girl and his servants will suffer, as we shall see. Verse 4, so now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him And he stayed with him three days. And so they ate and drank and lodged there. And it came to pass on the fourth day that they arose early in the morning and he stood to depart. But the young woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh your heart with a morsel of bread. Afterward, go your way. And so they sat down. The two of them ate and drank together. Then the young woman's father said to the man, Well, please, Be content to stay all night. Let your heart be merry. And when the man stood to depart, his father-in-law urged him. So he lodged there again. Do you see how the father-in-law wants the boy, the, the, the Levite, the husband, to stay? I think it's because he wants to have a few last moments with his daughter. As we have seen in the, the Old Testament before this, very often the, the, the newlywed will go bring her husband to the parents and this, to meet the parents, and that's the last time the daughter ever sees her mom and dad. So here we see this is kind of like his last goodbye to his little girl. And so it would be right for the Levite, this husband, to show mercy to his wife or his concubine and show mercy to his father-in-law and stay and let them have an extended goodbye. But this Levite, a minister, has no compassion. Uh, Verse 8, Then he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. But the young woman's father said, Please refresh your heart. So they delayed until afternoon, and both of them ate. And when the man stood to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young woman's father, said to him, Look, the day is now drawing toward evening. 
please spend the night. See, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here, that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow go your way early, so that you may get home. However, the man was not willing to spend that night. So he rose and departed and came opposite Jabus, that is Jerusalem. With him were the two saddled donkeys. His concubine was also with him. So he could have stayed, but he got a late start. He wasn't, he wasn't thinking. He, had, he was led by his feelings. He just didn't want to be tricked into staying another night. He didn't want to do that for his father-in-law or his young wife. And he just following his gut, following his emotions. He has no self-control. He leaves this house and it's in the afternoon, it says. How will he find a safe place to stay before the sun should set? Verse 11, they were near Jebus, and the day was far spent. And the servant said to his master, come, please let us turn aside into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. But his master said to him, we will not turn aside here into a city of foreigners who are not of the children of Israel, we will go on to Gibeah. So he stops and his servants, who are very wise and reasonable, say, we should go stay here in Jerusalem. Well, it was called Jebus at that time. Let's stay in Jerusalem. We can have a place to eat and be safe and a place to... But the minister, the man of the cloth, you could say, the religious professional said, I won't stay with those foreigners. He was prejudiced. And because of his prejudice against foreigners, uh, or perhaps the way that they spoke, or perhaps the way that they, um, their way that they worshipped, I don't know the details. He had something against that group of people. He wouldn't stay there. He followed his gut and left home in the middle of the day. Now he's following his prejudices, and it's going to cost him everything. And it's going to cost his wife the world. Now, verse um, 13. So he said to his servant, come, let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night in Gabeah or in Ramah, which are cities of, Jer of the Israelites. Verse 14. And they passed by and went their way and the sun went down on them near Gabeah, which belongs to Benjamin. They turned aside there to go in to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat down in the open square of the city. No one would take them into his house to spend the night. So they go into a city of the Israelites and no one would open their house and show hospitality to them. Of course, at that time, in that part of the world, showing hospitality was considered a basic kindness. In other words, the least anyone could do is let someone sleep in their front the front porch of their house, the front open area of their home. People lived in a one-room house back then. There was no such thing as furniture, really. So, But you could at least let someone sleep on the, the mat where all the other kids and the parents sleep. Or you could put them even on the ground under your roof in the entranceway to your house. But you would at least need to feed them and give them shelter. That was a basic kindness. But in this town of the Israelites, in uh, they showed no such kindness. Now, verse 16, just then an old man came in from his work in the field at evening, who also was from the mountains of Ephraim. He was staying in Gabeah, whereas the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he raised his eyes, he saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, where are you going? Where do you come from? And so he said to him, Well, we are passing from Bethlehem in Judah toward the remote mountains of Ephraim. I am from there. I went to Bethlehem in Judah. Now I am going to the house of the Lord. But there is no one who will take me into his house. Although we, we have both straw and fodder for our donkeys and bread and wine for myself, for your female servant and for the young man who is with your servant, there is no lack of anything. The old man said, peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. 
So he brought him into his house and gave fodder to the donkeys, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. And as they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man saying, Bring out the man who came to your house, that we, we may know him carnally. Does anyone know in Genesis the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? I know we studied it as a church. Um, it's, of course, the story of how there was a city, and in fact, many, many cities. I think there were seven cities at that time caught up in sexual immorality. And there was a believing family there uh, who lived in there. It was Abraham's nephew, Lot. And God, in mercy, sent angels to bring Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah because judgment was coming. And before God would bring judgment upon the city of sexual immorality, um, God brought wanted to bring the believers out. And there was only one family of believers in the whole city or the whole group of cities. And the angels go in and they, they're in the appearance of men and they go into Lot's presence and they say, you need to leave with us right now. You need to, uh, judgment is coming. Get your family, get your daughters, get your wife. Let's go. Uh, you believe in the Lord. God wants to save you. And as the angels are in the, in the appearance of men, for we see in Hebrews in the New Testament and, of course, Genesis in the Old Testament that angels very often appear undistinguishably from as a man. Never as women, interestingly, but they're all often as, as men. Um, and so... The men, in the form of men, these angels knock on the door. They engage with Lot, and they're trying to save that family. And as they are doing this, men of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah demand the angels, or these men, be given to them that they, and the same words used here are used by the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, that we might know them carnally. In other words, that they might rape these men. And so the men of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to rape these, what they thought were men, coming into their town. And now we, see, and, and we know how it worked with Sodom and Gomorrah. The angels defeated these wicked men and brought Lot and his family out. And God's judgment fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And they were all destroyed. Not just the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, but also the other cities in the valley. But those who believed were spared. And we look at the fire that fell from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah and we say, Lord, this is what sin does. And yet here we see that even God's people who have the covenant of God, uh, they received the promises of the Lord, the word of the Lord. Benjamin, they were the tribe that would first receive uh, the king, great King Saul out of, from Israel. Benjamin, Saul himself, Saul the apostle would come from this line. What, is there a more hero-laden uh, tribe than Benjamin? The best of us have the worst of us in sin. And they, too, become like the Sodom and Gomorrah, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's a reflection on what sin does. Just because there was a, I just say it again, just because there was a generation with gray hair that we remember when we were young, that built churches and preached the gospel does not mean we live by that same gospel. Our, each generation must be saved. God has no grandchildren. Each child, each person must come before the Lord and either be judged for their sins or let Jesus' sacrifice on the cross be the washing of their sins they need. And so the Benjamites, these people of Israel, seek to rape the Levite who's visiting their town. Verse 23. But the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brethren, I beg you, do not act so wickedly. Seeing this man has come into my house, do not commit this outrage. 
He starts off really good. He's got to finish good too. He doesn't. Verse 24. Look, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out now. Humble them and do with them as you please. But to this man do not do such a vile thing. Why did he show such favor towards this Levite? I have no idea. We can't say for sure. But it was wrong. It was deadly wrong. Verse 24. Look, verse 25. But the men would not heed him. So the man took his concubine and brought her out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. Then the woman came as the day was dawning and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. And when her master arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to get his to go his way, there was his concubine fallen at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. And he said to her, get up, let us be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her onto the donkey and the man got up and went to his place. And when he entered his house, he took a knife and he laid hold of his concubine and divided her into 12 pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. So it was that all who saw it said, no such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, confer, and speak up. (laughs) So terrible. I'm so glad I don't have to go through this on a Sunday morning with little five-year-old girls sitting over there because their moms and dads won't check them into the kids' department. (sighs) Some parts of the Bible are for adults only because some parts of the Bible are speak of this darkness of our hearts that no child can comprehend. The innocence of a child cannot understand what sin compounds to sin. And this man brought a sin into his heart when he married a second, a, a little girl calling her his second wife. And her body is mutilated for it. But this atrocious sin, deadly, is like all sins, and it's contagious. Sin we know to be sin because it refuses to stay put. If you ever ask yourself, hey, is it a sin to fill in the blank? Or if someone ever asks you, hey, dad, is it a sin to fill in the blank? One of the ways you can answer is you ask, well, will it stay put? Because sin, when it's in your heart, wants to cause you to do more sin. Yeah, okay, you lied that one time. You're going to naturally want to lie again. Oh, oh, you cheated that one time. It's going to want to make it so you cheat again. Sin won't stay put. That's how one way we know it's sin. And this man who just chopped up his little girl, this his second wife, this little young lady, is now going to watch the nation chopped up as well. Sin spreads every time. So in verse chapter 20, so all the children of Israel came out from Dan to Beersheba, that is, from the very far north to the very far south, as well as from the land of Gilead, and the congregation gathered together as one man before the Lord at Mizpah. And the leaders of all the people and all the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God. 400,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. Then the children of Israel said, tell us, how did this wicked deed happen? So we find now for the first time in all of Judges, you Bible students might notice, this is the first time and the only time when all of the nations were, all of the tribes of Israel were gathered. Was it to worship the Lord? No, no. Was it to build a monument to the goodness of God? No, no, forget about that nonsense. Of course not. What will draw them together? 
but when they seek to judge and kill somebody of their own. And so here they're going to slaughter the Benjamites. There's 400,000 foot soldiers, and they're going to battle against that one tribe who is the tribe that contains that one city, which is that one city that contains, I don't know how many men assaulted this poor little girl. Five, ten? I, we're, we don't know. But 400,000 men of Israel are ready to fight. Why? Because something about sin tears us into violence and division. Verse 6. Actually, I'd like to skip the next couple of passage, verses for time's sake. So the Levite recounts what happened where his wife is raped and murdered, and he sends her body parts to all of the tribes. So verse 8. So all the people arose as one man, saying, None of us will go to his tent, nor will any turn back to his house. But now this is the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up it against it by lot. We will take ten men out of every hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, a hundred out of every thousand, and a thousand out of every ten thousand, to make provisions for the people. That when they came, they come to Gibeah and Benjamin, they may repay all the vileness that they have done in Israel. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, united together as one man. Then, verse 12, the tribes of Israel uh, sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What is this wickedness that has occurred among you? Now, therefore, deliver up the men, the perverted men who are in Gibeah that we may put them to death and remove the evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not listen to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. Can we stop there? So we see this terrible sin of a man taking a second wife. Maybe it was his third or fourth wife. We don't know. It spreads. He shows some kind of prejudice against the city of Jerusalem and some kind of lack of mercy against his father-in-law by letting his his wife stay an extended time there at home. And in his haste, he ends up visiting a city of the Benjamites and they rape and kill his wife. It's just atrocious. And yet now we see another sin. This group of 10 to 20 men who raped and killed a foreign, a woman, a stranger to their town. Now, when an army of 400,000 Israelites comes knocking on their door, They demand that the men who committed this atrocity be turned over for justice. Benjamin said, no, we're not giving them up. The tribe of Benjamin stood with the rapists. We just consider that. Now, I'm not sure I would have have sat with me 10 years ago. But today, that stands out to me. Because I see that there are people who can get so caught up in an ideology that they don't even see someone's been raped and killed. We see some of that happening in Israel. Remember on October 7th, a thousand Jews were slaughtered, many of them women and children, hundreds uh, kidnapped, women dragged naked, abused, broken hips broken, pelvises broken, raped and dead, left dead. And then there's people in our own country, in our own town, saying that wasn't, there, there wasn't, that was not a sexual assault, that was justice. People in our town saying that the rape and the murder that happened to Israelis this year doesn't qualify as a war crime because they're Jews, because they're Israelis. People sometimes can side with wickedness, blinded by their own ideology and I just I don't really want to make it this be about a them versus us because I myself can have blind spots too and we all need to be very careful that we don't get so caught up to side with the murderer the rapist is there a day coming when we might in our zeal for being whoever we are We might lose sight of what's right and what's wrong. Nothing can ever justify rape or murder. 
And I, we, we look at this because we live in a time where we've forgotten right and wrong. Our society has forgotten the Bible and God. And if we're not careful, that same loss of right and wrong can invade us. For the Benjamites had more of a witness of God in them than we ever have had. The, the ark is with the Ten Commandments about 50 miles up the street. They've got the witness of the Lord. The monument of those 12 stones, that's like 100 miles down the road. Where Joshua, great-granddad, parted the Jordan River and all of Israel crossed. That happened like 150 years ago. These people know these stories. It's their story. It's their history. Not in a black and white and a dusty old book. That's mom and dad. And if the Benjamites have lost what's right and what's wrong, siding with a murderer, it's, it can happen to you and me too. We've got to be sure we're bathing in Scripture, bathing in the Lord, saying, God, show me righteousness. Lord, teach me your ways. I don't want to learn my ways from the people around me because the world, if they become my compass, can lead me to dangerous ends. And so the Benjamites are standing with these murderers and rapists. Verse 14, instead, the children of Benjamin gathered together from their cities to Gibeah to go to battle against the children of Israel. And from their cities at that time, the children of Benjamin numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword. Besides the inhabitants of Gibeah, who numbered 7,000 select men. So there's about 35,000 Benjamites versus 400,000 Israelites of the other 11 tribes. Uh, it's not going to go well. Let's jump ahead to verse 17. Now, besides Benjamin, the men of Israel numbered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All of these were men of war. Then the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God to inquire of God. They said, which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin? The Lord said, Judah first. Let's step back here. How many soldiers were mustered against the Midianites when Gideon, remember him? He saved the, the Israelites. It was like 100, and, I don't remember, 130,000 to save the people. They were all caught up in servants to these foreigners, and only 100,000 would stand. But now they're ready to slaughter the Benjamites, and 400,000 sign up. It's a sad thing. Some of us love the idea of killing our brother more than the enemy. And here we see that it says in verse 18 that the children of Israel arose, and they inquired of God. Let's just review what that means. So at that time, People in the Old Testament, it says in Deuteronomy that when you want to see, find, go to ask a question of the Lord, you would go to the tabernacle and you would ask the priest, hey, priest, this is what we want to do. And he would um, seek God and then he would do something like pull straws and it would either be yes or no. So here when he and they would take that, that yes or no as being from the Lord because they seek, sought him in prayer. The priest sought him in prayer. And so that was just, nonetheless, how it was practiced at that time. I'm thankful to live in the time where we can just talk to God the Father because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross through the person of the Holy Spirit today. Nonetheless, they didn't ask, um, Lord, should we be battling Benjamin? They did ask, who shall go first? And, and so somehow, we don't understand exactly how this works. It says in verse 23 that the Lord said, go up against them. So verse 24, so the children of Israel approached the children of Benjamin on the second day. and Benjamin went out against them from Gibeah on the second day and cut down to the ground 18,000 more of the children of Israel. All these drew the sword. Then all, So that was actually the second time. So Israel comes against Benjamin and Benjamin defeats him. Israel tries again. Benjamin defeats them. Thousands upon thousands of Israelites are dying. Verse 26, all the children of Israel, that is all the people, went up and came to the house of God and wept. 
They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So the children of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days. So that, that's the list of the, the priests. So the high priest was Aaron, and then his son, and then his son after him. So that's the three generations we're talking about. And so Phineas was serving in the tabernacle, and they present their question to the priest, Phineas, shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. So it's interesting that God is now going to give them victory. And I am going to spare you the details of this because I'd like to move on to the next chapter. But uh, Israelites destroy the Benjamites. Almost, I, I think the numbers, uh, 600 are spared um, by accident. 600 escape. And can you think about that? 24,000 uh, Benjamites are, are killed by their countrymen. And I don't remember the number exactly, but something like 80,000 Israelites are killed in this battle. Um, it's interesting that the Lord didn't give victory to the Israelites until the third battle, after 80,000 or so had died. Because I find that interesting because I think that the, if the Lord was on the side of Israel, they're doing what's right. They're trying to bring justice for this little girl who was raped and killed. I think that God would have given Israel victory immediately. But the fact of the matter is that the sin that was in that city of Gibeah was probably in other cities in Benjamin, which is probably why the Benjamites wouldn't give up those, the, the criminals who raped and killed, because they too were rapists or, crim, or murderers. And I suspect that the Lord allowed so many of the other tribes of Israel to die in battle because they too were terrible sinners as well. And in God's justice, he uses these bloody battles as a way of working his judgment, just as fire fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, and about the same number fell. Here, the same number fall, the same number of people die in God's judgment, but not from fire, but from war. And so now um, in verse chapter 21, we see how they've made this terrible bloodshed. And now they're going to, how do you right a wrong? How do you fix what you've done when you realize you shouldn't do this? There's only 600 or so Benjamites left. Of all of the tribe of Israel, of Benjamin, there's only uh, 600 men, verse 47, yeah. So <laughs> what do you do? How do you right this wrong? You've almost slaughtered one of your brothers, the 12 tribes of Israel. One of them is now almost dead. Well, they, at that time, if they don't have the Bible and they're not following God, they just come up with a solution that makes sense to them. And it's going, who do you think is going to suffer for it? Is it the strong and the wealthy and the educated and the rulers? Is it the king? No, it's the little girls. Every time, it's the, it's the, the vulnerable who suffer. So verse 20, chapter 21. Now the men of Israel had sworn an oath at Mizpah saying, none of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin as a wife. So then the people came to the house of God and remained there before God till evening. And they lifted up their voices and wept bitterly and said, O oh Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel, that today there shall be one tribe missing in Israel? Why, Lord, why? Because they did it themselves. They killed them. And here they have the audacity to be going to God like you know, have you ever heard of like those people who go to church on Christmas and Easter and when they're sick? Here they are going to the tabernacle when they're sick. They're like, we just slaughtered one of the tribe tribes, Lord. One of the 12 tribes, Lord. Why has this happened? They did it themselves. Anyway, now verse 4. So it was on the next morning that the people rose early and built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings the children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel who did not come up with the assembly of the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning anyone who had not come up to the Lord at Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. So they had making, taken a stupid oath. 
following their own hearts, not the Lord. The Lord says, be careful about taking oaths. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't make an oath. Just whatever you say, do it. Because sometimes when we make oaths, it's boasting. And these guys had taken an oath, verse 2 declares, that none of us are going to give our children as wives to the, the 600 Benjamites who were left, who escaped our sword. So now the Benjamites are all going to disappear as a generation because of a stupid oath, a stupid boastful word. And so then they, after they're worshiping the Lord or kind of in the presence of God somehow, they cry out to him and they say, we've got an idea. Was there any amongst any of the tri cities of Israel that didn't show up in our war? Because we had also made another oath. God doesn't say to do that. They just did it of their own choice. That if anyone doesn't show up to this battle, they can die. And so they do check their books, and it turns out there was one tribe who didn't show up to kill the Benjamites. It was probably to their credit that they didn't show up because the, they knew that the Benjamites were no better than anyone else or no worse. So they're going to find this one tribe. So verse 10, so the congregation sent out their 12,000 of their most valiant men and commanded them saying, go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, including the women and children. So they're going to kill the women and children. Did the children make any decision about not going to war? No. This is just violence upon violence. Lawlessness upon lawlessness. They found out that this city didn't come to war, so they're going to slaughter everybody. Verse 11, and this is the thing you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every male, every woman, and every woman who has known a man intimately. So they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man intimately, and they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. So they spare 400 little girls who had not yet been married. At that time, as in much of the world today, when a girl is in her home and she's not yet married, she wears whatever she wants. Uh, but once she's married, her, her garments change. Often she wears a different head, car, head covering. Often she wears a longer skirt or uh, she starts wearing jewelry for the first time. There's different things depending on the culture and the period of time that demark a, a woman who's married from a woman who's not married. And so they're looking for a woman, these girls, they're slaughtering everybody. But if the person's, a girl's not wearing the garments of a woman who's married, they're kidnapping her and they're going to force her into marriage with the Benjamites. You say, who comes up with this? The answer is people who don't follow God. Okay, so verse 13. So the whole congregation sent word to the children of Benjamin who were at the rock of Rimmon. And announced peace to them. So Benjamin came back at that time. And they gave them the women whom they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead. And yet they had not found enough for them. So they could only find 400 little girls to kidnap and make the wives of the remaining Benjamin survivors. And they're like, oh no, well, that's, not, that's not right. Because there's 200 men who aren't going to have a wife. Um. None of this is called by God. This is just man coming up with ideas. And not one of them is a good idea. Verse 16. So then the elders of the congregation said, Well, what shall we do for wives for those who remain, since the women of Benjamin have been destroyed? And they said, There must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin, that a tribe may not be destroyed from Israel. However, we cannot give them wives for our daughters, for the children of Israel have sworn an oath, saying, Cursed be the one who gives a wife to Benjamin. So then they said, In fact, there is a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh, which is north of Bethel, on the east side of the high highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Labona. Therefore they instructed the children of Benjamin, saying, Go, lie in wait in the vineyards, and watch, and just when the daughters of Shiloh came out to perform their dances, then come out from the vineyards and every man catch a wife. That could be translated kidnap a wife. For himself from the daughters of Shiloh, then go to the land of Benjamin. 
did you notice that they stole these little girls who were dancing in, the, in and around the tabernacle? This is where people gather to worship the Lord. Uh, at the tabernacle, the Bible calls for there to be worship every day. Of course, on the Sabbath, there was an even greater worship. Uh, people would gather for Bible studies and the sacrifices. But every day, people would be gathering for worship and for prayer. It was open during as long as the sun was up. And here, girls are gathering for this feast to dance before the Lord. And I think it's fascinating that of all the little girls in Israel that were stolen into captivity to be made wives, forced into being a wife of sinful Benjamites, they chose girls at worship. And I think that that's the way of this world that we live in. Because a man um, who was a minister was corrupt in this little way. He let his lusts and his libido be his God. Chose wife after wife after wife, and he probably thought he could handle it. And slowly it spread. He loses his wife. His nation is torn to pieces. A hundred thousand or so perish, and almost the tribe of Benjamin is slaughtered. And 600 little girls are stolen again and made slaves or made some kind of wife to strangers. And they were little girls at worship. And I see this in this arch uh, that happens when there's no king amongst us, when we don't let the Lord be our God. Let's see how this chapter concludes. It concludes as it started. Thus ends the book of Judges, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so I I just encourage you, we, we ought to pray for each other. What I mean by that is for Christians. We always are taught we should pray for the non Christian. Yeah, do that too. But we need our prayers, we need each other to lift each other up for mutual accountability, support, strengthening. If you see a minister collecting wives, spare the little girls in the future and walk alongside him and give him chastisement and correction. Pray for him and give him the support he needs. If you see little girls who are worshiping and someone's ready to steal them away, protect them as your own child. It's all connected. You know, I think that if we hold our worship of the Lord loosely, like we hold each other to no account, people can do whatever they want. You do whatever you want to your girlfriend. Treat your children however you want over there. Worship whatever you want. Read, read or don't read or misinterpret your Bible however you want. We give people such a long rope and it strangles them. They strangle themselves. But always the children, the vulnerable ones suffer. And it might take a generation. But the weak amongst us, the vulnerable, are stolen away. And so I, we, we close the book of Judges and I, I just ask us to be prayerful. That if there's a sense of Christians will be Christians. Um, pastors will be pastors. Look, he can, grow, he can draw a crowd. Wow, that's a, that guy shows up for kids' ministry. He's pretty faithful. Um, well, that guy goes to church once a year. He says he's a Christian. It's time that we draw people closer to the Lord. We, that we raise the, count, the bar of accountability on what's right. And we need to start with the house of the Lord. So some of us, you know, I think that we have a tendency to look at the world. And we're so broken for what's happening in the news and in our community. There's a place for that. But all the more, let us pray for and serve and love and help one another. Because as Christians thrive in Christ, we leave a, a legacy of safety for the 
hurting and for the vulnerable. But if we neglect one another and we let each other slip one step further in backsliding, it's not you who will suffer, those who are strong amongst us and have money in the bank accounts. It's the kids. It's the women, the children. So, Father, we we pray for this generation that follows us. Um, Those who can run all day long and not be weary and they laugh and laugh and laugh so loud and they play, play, play. Lord, we don't want anyone to steal their joy. Not now or not when they're older. And Father, we pray for our, our nation. We pray for our, the Shenandoah Valley. Lord, we, would you help us to draw Christians into a closer walk with Jesus, a purer, more holy walk with Jesus? that husbands might love their wives more than ever before and that wives might be devoted to their husbands like never before, that children might learn to respect and fear their father and to walk in joy with their parents, that um, that they might live a long life enjoying Jesus every day. And Lord, we just we lift our, our children and the generation that follows us up to you We ask you protect them by purifying us. In Jesus' name we pray.